Welcome Traveller to another Warhammer Renaissance Battle Report from the Chrono Command Games. I will be your old world chronicler to tell you the tale between the forces of good and evil as they fight for domination over a small village located on the border princes in the outskirts of the Empire. Let us now take a look at both armies in closer detail, starting with the Orcs. The Orcs are led by Azag the Slaughterer with his crown of sorcery, making him a third level Dark Mage. The Blade of Darting Steel, which hits automatically, and his Troll Hide Armor, giving him a regeneration save of 4. Nigdat Banner Twat is Azag's faithful Goblin Battle Standard Bearer, holding the magic banner of Gob Awesomeness. And in it, the Orc Master Shaman with his two Dispel Scrolls and Crimson Amulet. As for the regiments, we have the Tuffies, which are 30 common goblins armed with spears, shields, and light armor and their standard carries the Bitfrost Banner, which allows them to move through difficult terrain as if it was open terrain. And they are led by Goofin, the Goblin Boss, with his Van Hortsman Speculum, which switches his puny stats with his adversaries in hand-in combat. Sneaky, hey? And for the more heavily handed units, we have Gork's Boys, which are 22 Orc Boy Biggins with spears, shields and light armor, carrying the banner of Arcane Warding, which confers a 4 plus to spell against magic, and even for spells powered by total power. And they are led by Grumgit, a boss with the drums of swift reform, allowing the unit to make reforms after march moves. And an Orc Big Boss, Zorgut, carrying a Venom Sword dealing d6 wounds and a Potion of Strength giving a plus 3 boost to his strength for the turn of combat. We also have Snog the Giant who is a good kisser, apparently. Brutes in Boots, our favourite Ogre Mercenary unit of Renown. And they are carrying the Banner of Speed, giving them a plus 1 to their movement characteristic. And the Dummies, a bunch of stupid stone trolls which are ready to vomit their corrosive spew all over those damn stinking elves. For Althurian's war host, we have the elf himself. With Stormwing, his trusted griffin mount, and Eltharian, his preset items, which include Fang Sword, which gives a minus three save and minus one attack to his enemies, the Helm of Yoresi, allowing him to always reroll leadership tests, and the Talisman of Hoth, giving Eltharian the ability to cast spells as a level two mage and use college magic spells. Teclis is his elf of choice for his war host with magic supremacy, and Teclis also has preset items, which are the Moonstaff of Lilith that allows Teclis to receive 2d6 wins and magic cards for one turn during the game, but also halves all his characteristics rounded up for the rest of the battle. The War Crown of Safari gives Teclis an extra magic level, enabling him to carry 5 items and 5 spells, and making him a 5 level mage. And the Sword of Teclis that wounds automatically. And finally, he carries one power scroll and one dispel scroll. The main regiments of the war host are two units of high elf archers comprising of 12 and 14 strong, six heavy cavalry silver helms, two units of 16 strong high elf spearmen, a unit of six Illyrian reavers and 10 shadow warriors, and lastly, two mighty bolt throwers that can fire either a single shot at 48 inches, strength six, d3 wounds with no armor save, or a multiple shot of 4 bolts at strength 4 with no save. But before we get underway with the game, I just wanted to clarify what Warhammer Renaissance is. Warhammer Renaissance is a non-commercial fan-based remake of Warhammer Fantasy Battle as it was played in the 90s, and it was created by Balder Asmussen. You can find the group and all the files needed to download and try Warhammer Renaissance for free on Facebook. The cover of the rulebook has some stunning art by legendary artist John Blanche, and the book is filled with the nostalgic imagery of the early 90s from Games Workshop Publications. My opponent today is Dr. Tom from Tokyo, and he will be fielding the High Elves in today's game. Tom won the roll for table sides, and then we both mapped out our deployments in secret on a piece of paper as per the rules. Which is an aspect that I really enjoy about Warhammer Renaissance, in that you can't be sure where units will be situated on the tabletop until revealed, and it gives this wonderful sense of fog of war to each game.
and this was the first opportunity to fill my newest and best orc warlord of them all with the wonderful conversion of the original Marauder Shaman on Wyvern, originally designed by Ali Morrison, and I asked Kev the Goblin King Adams to add his Gork Touch to transform him into the legendary Orc Chieftain, and I think he did a splendid job. I hope you're watching this one, Kev, and thanks again, mate. With both armies now fully deployed, it was the time of judgement to see who would be granted the first turn of the game. Sadly, Azag could not seize the initiative and the first turn went now to the, into the hands of the pesky elves. And here is a look at the spells that we drew in our draft. We start with the hand of spells drawn by Teclas on the left and Eltharion on the right. As I drew his dark magic spells, and in it, the Orc Shaman, his war spells. In Warhammer Renaissance, you can draw a further three cards on your level to allow your casters more flexibility when they're assigned spells. Then you just throw back the three cards you don't want to give you your hand for the game. The Hales began the turn with aligning their bolt throwers and firing at the cutest boy on the board with Snog the Giant. But much to his relief, the bolt bounced off his bottom lip. Tom then began ordering his elves to release their full salvo of arrows onto the green skins, starting with the ogres, but was unable to penetrate their thick skinned hides but did manage to find weaker bodied green skins and downed a few of Gork's proud foot soldiers in the process. With the phases completed, we're now at the magic phase with Tom rolling high on a nine. Teclas, the 5th level mage, casts Coruscation or Fenrir to be able to elevate himself above the battlefield atop a white pillar of fire. As they tried to rebound it, but Gork was not with him as he failed to roll it on a 3. Teclas then followed up now with Snog, the giant in full view, and cast Glamour of Teclas, which forced Snog to make a leadership test on 3d6 each turn if he wished to move. In a try to dispel, yet again failed, putting Snog under Teclas' glamour. Now was the Orc and Goblin first turn, and it was time for the Orcs to march towards the village. Azag's greatest ability is that all units of Orc and Goblins within 12 inches don't suffer from animosity, which only leaves the stupidity test to do in the Trolls Pass easily. Sadly, Snog didn't pass his leadership test, and he was marched off the table to return at the start of my next turn. boys marched on towards their prized goal of the town to loot the booty. And after that was complete, I rolled a four for the winds of magic. Azag began the contest casting Blade Wind, targeting the Lyrian Reavers. The spell causes 3d6 hits minus the target's weapon skill. But the spell was dispelled with ease by Teclas on a 3. And that spell ended the very brief magic phase with this turn. The High Elf Bolt Throw crews now had the Ogres in close range and opened up two salvos of high velocity steel bolts at the unit and managed to cause three wounds and dropping an Ogre to the ground. The Archers also fancied their chances on causing more grief on the Ogres and managed to inflict a wound much to their surprise.
More High Elf arrows soared through the sky atop the goblins, and they took a few casualties as a result. And the roll for the Winds of Magic resulted in a five. Tom began the High Elf Magic phase casting Fiery Convocation, which deals 2d6 strength 4 hits and would have engulfed my goblin unit in magical flame. In it, the Orc Shaman praised Gork's name as he succeeded in a dispel. Bladewind was cast by Azag again, targeting the Reaver Knights, and Tom wasn't going to stop it this time. But the spell proved fruitless as only one stinking elf snuffed it in the end. To begin the Orc turn 2, Snog the Giant returned to the table edge he left under the effects of the Glamour spell. The trolls passed their stupidity test, and Azag ordered his slags forward to seek his rich rewards in the township. The ogres looked set to breach the tower gates. And the trolls looked mighty revolted at the elf stench that stood before them. And the winds of magic were blowing stronger with a result of seven. As I began the turn casting Soul Drain on the compactly regimented High Elf Spearmen, thwarted again by Teclis's Dispel Dominance, and with a further roll to destroy Soul Drain, ending in disappointment for Tom and Teclis. The third high off turn saw the units with Skull Munch's terrifying visage take tests and passing under their heroic influence of their general Etharian's leadership. Silverhelms passed their fear check, charged into the stony flank of the troll unit with lances seeking the hearts of these ancient beasts. And more bravery for the elves, as Eltharion on Stormwing flew into charge Azag the Slaughterer in a duel to the death. Seeing Eltharion charge into the heart of darkness of battle, it boosted the courage of the archers as they too charged the trolls in the front. The remaining units of spearmen moved up towards the village to defend it with their lives. And the sight of Teclis high on the pillar of white magical fire gave him the advantage of sight over the entire battlefield. The bolt thrower crews loaded single shots into their war machines and both struck into the side of the ogre unit. The bolt thrower crew cheered as two more ogres fell as they caused a further six wounds. The archers also took aim, but hadn't succeeded in causing a single wound. And in the end, the ogres passed their panic check. The Illyrian Reavers took long-range bow shots at the goblins, but the one shot that got through was saved by the blessed armor of Mork. And now we come to the center stage, where two of Warhammer's legends or lore are locked in the art of melee and magical combat, with their tame beasts of Wyvern and Griffin. Eltharion and Stormwing lunge into the fray with sword and talon, hoping to inflict mortal wounds on Azag and leave his mount unbound. Elves are not blessed by the gods of Gork and Mork, given how ineffectual their attempted strikes were. <laughs> well, you know. <gasps> what can you say? <laughs> Well, maybe Azag should have prayed harder as all of his four hits resulted in zero wounds. 
Skullmuncher, however, did score two wounds, but they were saved by Eltharion's superior Elven Armour. And with the combat results even, they would have to wait until the next turn to conclude their duel. We turn our attention to the next combat with the Stone Trolls being charged from both flank and front by the Silverhelms and Archers. Tom considered new dice as all the Silverhelms failed to hit any of the monstrous trolls, much to his disbelief, leaving it up to the Archers as they too wavered and failed to put a single wound on the stone-skinned trolls. The trolls in reply swung out at the Archers, knowing that they would be the softest of the two units and could inflict higher casualties. The trolls were successful in causing enough wounds to win them in the combat, and the archers failed their break tests and turned to flee. And Tom rolled a 4 for the Winds of Magic for this turn. Teclas cast his most damaging spell with Fiery Convocation at the Orcs, but in it the Shaman used his first Dispel Scroll to snuff it out. As they cast Blade Wind on the Silver Helms to see them off, but Teclas again successfully dispelled it and thus concluded the magic phase. The Orc and Goblins now have their chance to turn the tide of the battle in the beginning of their turn. And with Snog, the giant still under the spell Glamour of Teclas, he has been nullified the whole game thus far. The Goblins plucked the courage to charge into Eltharion and his terror causing Griffin Stormwing. And the ogres, now knowing they are under strength to seize the tower, sought shelter in the top of the building. And Snog, using his giant-like mentality, fought off to shake off the glamour spell influence and tested his leadership with six under 3d6. He did it! Did it! Smart giant. Yeah, nice. Okay. Snog, having the power now to move freely under his own will, marched towards the tower. And Goofin, the goblin boss, challenged Eltharion armed with the Van Hortzman Speculum. Goofin taking the first swing, now possessing the same attack, weapon skill and strength as Eltharion, thanks to his enchanted item, failed to land a single wound. But as Gork would will it, Tom managed to also fluff all of his rolls on both Eltharion and Stormwing, leaving Goofin alive and well for the next round. But as Eltharion lost the combat, he had to make a leadership test with 9 or under. Tough, toughing these low rolling dice. Yeah, yeah. Then they can't. They can't make it through. The Silverhelms had their chance to proclaim glory on the battlefield and inflicted an ungenerated wound on the trolls. The trolls retaliated with vomiting their corrosive liquid on the proud elf horsemen and killed three of them. As the combat result was tied, they would continue into the next turn. Winds of Magic blew a little stronger this time, with a result of 7. Teclas the Proud began the magic duel with casting Fiery Convocation on the Goblin unit, and in it replied with a Destroy Spell card to nullify and pray to Gork that to destroy the spell forever. Yeah! Okay. Azag, feeling he had the upper hand in this phase, cast Soul Drain with total power, but Teclas used his one and only Dispel Scroll, ending the magic phase. As Eltharion successfully tied up Azag in combat, Teclas ordered his elves to now take the initiative and take their positions in the town and hold up any other remaining Orc and Goblin units on the battlefield. The Alarian Reavers charged into the flank of the Goblins, and the fleeing archers rallied. The bolt thrower crews now had a new and large target to aim at, resulting in four wounds on Snog. Poor old Snog. With the shooting phase now complete, it was time to get stuck into the hand-to-hand -hand combat phase that will determine who will win the battle. Goofing, the goblin boss with a grin from ear to ear with his new magic item, struck simultaneously with Altharion in initiative order. His single wound was saved by Elwish armor once again. And Atharion replied and slayed the goblin boss with ease, leaving Stormwing to feast on his corpse. The charging light cavalry of the elven Illyrian Reavers crushed two goblin lives with spear and hooves. 
drilled goblin spearmen thrust out with their short yellow spears and managed to take the life of one of the reavers. Leaving the goblins now needing an eight or less with Azag in the break test having lost the combat. Both units, so that's, that's for the goblin unit? Yeah. And then for Azag? Let's roll the fire. I can't really see anything. The silver helms again were needed to hold the front line as the trolls now seemed unstoppable. And even though they caused two wounds to the trolls, the trolls replied with vomit attacks killing all the remaining three knights of Ulthwan. And a nice even six was rolled for the winds of magic. With the High Elves deciding not to cast it first, Tom passed the initiative to me, and Azag was ready to let all hell loose with the dark magic spell Antipel's Black Horror. With Tom now in a real predicament, he remembered Teclas had his Moonstaff of Lilith and he decided to use it right now, rolling his 2d6 dice to gain that many wins and magic cards for this magic phase only. <laughs> Do that. Yeah, yeah. Seven. Wow. Okay. Now with a fresh hand of cards, Tom used Rebound to dispel and recast a spell of the same power back at me. The Tempest rages within me. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, we're doing it. Okay, we're casting the Tempest. Yeah. Okay. There you go. He succeeded and the Tempest was summoned by Teclas. The Tempest spell being quite destructive to buildings and war machines, Azag was happy to let that through and chose not to dispel it. If anything, the bolt throwers would suffer heavily with the tempest raging across the battlefield, causing a lot of damage in the process. Now the time to make these pesky pointy ears pay with their lives. As I ballad orders to the trolls to advance and close the gap of the spearmen making their way to the village. Banner Git and the orcs were quite happy to just keep guard of the village and keep the elves out. As there was no shooting we went straight into the hand-to-hand -hand combat phase. Eltharion, now free of goofing, was able to direct all his attacks and Stormwings too at Azag. Tooth Claw and Sword Blade cut into the troll hide armor that Azag used to protect himself, but the regenerative powers of the armor was not enough to save his green hide this day and he fell to the mortal wounds suffered at the hands of the elven prince and his beast. Oh. Made one. But he's dead. He's only got three wounds. Yeah. Killed it. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> With Skullmunch's master now fallen, we had to make a roll on the monster reaction table to see how the wyvern will react. Rolling 2d6, the worst result possible. Having rolled a three, the Skullmuncher moved directly away and towards the nearest table edge. Fear started to grip the goblins, seeing their warlord die in the heroic challenge with Altharion, and had to hold out against all odds. The Reavers took a few more goblin lives before the goblins could retaliate, and miraculously caused a wound on Stormwing in the combat. With all hope apparently lost, the goblins broke and ran to save their green skins. The Reavers overran the goblins with ease and cut them down without mercy. And we were in for a big magic phase with a roll of 10 for the Winds of Magic. Orc Shaman in it finally had a chance to make an impact in the game, casting Here We Go to encourage the Orc Biggins, but it was halted when Teclas dispelled it. Tom then took back the Glamour of Teclas spell from Snog. 
only to cast it again on the Stone Trolls this time, knowing they had a leadership of four and would be a perfect target. Is it right? Oh, we'll never forgive me. Oh, oh unlucky. unlucky. Okay. And with the Stone Trolls failing their natural dispel of a four plus, they were now under the influence of Teclas. In it then tried blowing the head off Eltharion to show these pointy ears the might of the Orc Gods, but yet again, Teclas dispelled it and spoiled the fun for the boys. At the start of Tom's turn he had to determine the damage caused to his war machines and the buildings from the Tempest, and much to the delight of the Orcs, one of the bolt throwers was obliterated. The two buildings shook and creaked as the Tempest also damaged them by a single point. Remaining Elven units now converged onto the town to secure its safety as the Orcs seemed to be in disarray after the loss of their fearsome warlord Azag. Lyrian Reavers escorted the Wyvern to see it off the table, and Altharian ushered Stormwing to move into a closer position to the Orc Biggins. And the remaining bolt thrower and crew lined up a shot to poor old Snog. He only wanted to kiss Eltharion in a loving embrace and stuff him in his yes. bag for a snack later wow. on. He shoots. He scores. He hits. <laughs> <laughs> okay, strength six. What's his toughness? Six. Six. Watch it bounce off his head. No, got him. Got him. D3. He's got two ones left. You got him. Twanged him. Tom, you just made your day, man. Yeah, I'm a fan. <laughs> Bolt throwers forever. Keep out. <laughs> my heart goes out to Snog the giant as his spirit drifts up into the heavens. And Tom rolled an eight to get the magic phase underway. The Orc Shaman in it did have some success in getting off the Here We Go spell. but then was thwarted with the Brain Burster being dispelled yet again by that Smarty Pants Teclas. The Orc turn began with the Trolls failing their obligatory stupidity test, which resulted them in stumbling forward, but Teclas was safe, as he was still atop his white pillar of fire. To see the biggins cheer, here we go, and charge into the Elf Spearmen was a glorious sight, and Gork be praised for this day. And the boys got stuck in and they did what they do best, bashed those elf heads and made good work with their magical boon they were receiving from Gork and Mork with the Here We Go spell. Tom on the other hand was having mixed feelings about the new dice set he'd recently bought. Uh, and it's strength three against stuff as well, so that Four. doesn't... Four. Uh, new fives. Yeah, so nothing. <laughs> Do you like those dice, Tom? Yeah, I'm sending them back. <laughs> the elves in the end turned and fled, which had the boys testing to restrain, but they couldn't hold back, and surged forth, only to stop when they ran into a fresh unit of pointy-eared gits. And at this stage of the game, and late in the day, it was evident that those pesky bloody elves had outsmarted and outmagicked us orcs, and it just wasn't fair. But it was clear that Tom had won at the day just on points with the death of Azag and the giant, and it was just a matter of time that he would be able to secure the tower and bring peace to this part of the empire once again. Tom, and well done, mate, on your first Thank victory you. using the high Yes. Elves. Well, I was happy for Tom to win the game using the high elves, as this is something I can never accomplish myself, as the cowardly bastards always pull up their skirts and run away for their dear lives when I am in command of them. But I'm really an orc in disguise, to be honest, killing those pointy ears off one by one. Haha, <laughs> praise Gork! And thank you for watching another battle report. And thanks to Tom for his friendship and being a fantastic opponent on the day. And you as the viewers, and I hope you enjoyed this battle report today. Finally, a massive big warm hug from Gork and Mork to all my patrons. I can't do this without you guys. So thank you very much to my Storm Boys, and I look forward to bringing you another battle report in the future.